Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, we can start. Uh, we can start with the uh, following discussion. Uh, first of all, uh, welcome, uh, welcome to all of you who uh, came to uh, this uh, discussion at the Days of Anti-Capitalism. Uh, there is uh, in the back there is some uh, food, so you can definitely uh, help yourself. Uh, you don't have to be hungry for all the time. And uh, then uh, on the other side, in the back, there is uh, our stand of uh, socialist solidarity. We sell uh, magazines in there, and it's very interesting. So uh, I recommend uh, to check uh, check it out. Uh, yeah. So uh, again, the following discussion will be in uh, English. So to all of you who do, don't speak Czech, don't uh, don't worry. You will uh, probably understand uh, everything. Uh, yeah, and uh, this discussion is uh, about the situation of uh, socialist opposition in uh, Poland and in Hungary. And uh, today's speakers are Filip Ilkowski from uh, Pracownicza Demokracja, and uh, he's also active trade unionist in the teachers' unions in Poland. So this is the first uh, speaker. Uh, the second speaker is uh, Aaron Rosmankis from uh, SIGRA from uh, Hungary. He's in charge of uh, international relations of uh, SIGRA. So uh, welcome, and uh, yeah, you can uh, you can now start uh, start uh, speaking. Then after uh, both of uh, our speakers will finish, uh, there will be room for questions. So. Uh, yeah, you can you can ask, and there will be a discussion in the end. So, uh, Philip, uh, time for your uh, speech. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for invitation. First of all, always really a pleasure to be in the events organized by Socialistička Solidarita, and I think it's you know very important also this. Internationalism is clearly very important for socialist politics, but also in this uh, more narrow uh, regional version, it has its own dimension, this internationalism, because not only because of history, but some similar similarities that uh, we can observe when you look in the political situation in uh, our, <laughs> I hope, I don't want to say in our states, because they are not really ours in the sense of the ordinary people who are living there, but in the states that we live in. So Hungary, Czech Republic, Poland clearly has some common dimension here. Uh, first of all, maybe a few words about specificity of Polish government. As you probably know, we have kind of populist right uh, government uh, by the party called Peace, uh, Peace or Law and Justice in, uh, in English. Um, this year we will have elections in Poland and it is uh, now eight years since uh, Law and Justice, Peace, took over power in 2000, 2015. Um, and it is quite, I think, important and interesting to analyze, to analyze uh, Peace uh, as a specific form of uh, right-wing uh, populism, populism that is, of course, very much overused name in a in a sense. But by populism, I mean uh, kind of politics that is, at least in the rhetorics, very much oriented to criticism of elites, whatever it means. But this criticism, this uh, political buildings against elites, is not class-based. And in right-wing version of populism, always what comes very quickly is nationalism simply, or various kinds of nationalist ideas, when supposedly elites are not national enough and the whole nation should unite against, against them. So there are many, of course, versions of this populism, and including right-wing populism. Peace is uh, representing one of them, it's one of most important characterization that uh, it is populism very much mm, connected to social demagogy used by the uh, Polish government. So besides of this uh, trying to criticize the whole transition period from 
basically nationalist perspective and this right-wing populist perspective, peace promised to deliver to ordinary people that they will break with uh, this liberal period when many people were, of course, losing out. And uh, on this base, they managed to a large extent to win the elections in 2015 and then for the second time 2000, in 2019 as, as well. Mm. Interestingly, peace in power stands still on these two main uh, legs in a way. One is still this social demagogy and uh, what is important to stress that all the social programs of law and justice government that are uh, transceding what one can call private welfare state approach, so simply giving some money to some you know, social groups. So anything beyond this was very clear a big failure. So for example, attempts to repair housing uh, in Poland, one of the absolutely huge social problem in Poland connected to housing, especially to young people. Government promised to do something about this and they tried some programs. It was really visible favor, uh, failure. Even among its own electorate, it is seen like this. The same for health service that was really a crap and still if, is a crap after eight years of uh, peace government. The same for education. Again, lots of problems with, you know, overcrowded classrooms, uh, underpaid teachers, and lots, lots of problems connected to this, uh, including, of course, psychological problems with kids, uh, with people in all levels of uh, education. So, in general, all those attempts to, and promises to say that we will make a break and whatever, it, it will be better, it was a clear, clear failure. So, how was possible for peace to live, uh, to live in a way, live in the political life for these eight years and to be a party that still has in the opinion polls above 30% of uh, popularity? Uh, it is because, in fact, two social programs, when, when we are on this level of uh, social promises that uh, peace managed to deliver, one very popular program, child allowance, so all you know, kids, so people who have kids really, they were uh, given some money from, from government. At the beginning it was for the second kid, then also for the first kid, 500 zlotys, what was more than 100 euro in 2015. Mm. And it was, you know, it was something, right, for each kid. Uh, so it was one very popular, clearly, program that uh, PiS is still is still saying that it is its a uh, huge achievement. And the other was lowering of retirement age, because the previous government, government of the you know standard liberal coalition, uh, levered up the retirement age to 67 years, from 60 to it was before 60 for women, 65 for men. It, it was up to 67 in some, you know, distance that was a road to 67. And peace cancelled this deform, uh, so-called reform. Just came back to the previous situation. So not really a very big deal, but of course in symbolic sense it has its meaning, especially for the elderly people. Uh, but the other lack of law and justice was connection of the social rhetorics with really toxic racism, toxic anti-LGBT rhetorics, anti-migrant rhetorics, but, but really on the level of uh, far right in, uh, in Europe. One can even argue that, you know, for example, parties rooted in fascist uh, movements and with, you know, this really fascist origins like Le Pen in France, they, they don't even use such rhetorics now, of course, to cover their fascism. Nevertheless, peace is quite open. When you look at the state on media, it is really, really awful propaganda against all those uh, groups. So, migrants, as I say, especially Muslim migrants, and uh, now in this year, 
what is uh, on the agenda are LGBT people, especially trans people, and their mm, the governmental propagandists try to make use of all this, you know, hate propaganda. So, if you can imagine from a left-wing point of view, it is a very, very bad situation in a way when the governmental party combines social rhetorics and attacks of liberalism with not really delivering much, but delivering a bit and trying to, you know, build on this, connecting this with all this toxic, racist, homophobic, anti-women, family values, and so on uh, stuff. And uh, one more point that I should be also very, very, uh, should be underlined very much. All this also in connection with really turbo militarism that we observe in Poland now. Poland was very quickly militarizing country even before peace government. It was one of the leaders, and Polish government is always very happy when they can, can call themselves leaders in, in area or somewhere. So it was one of the leaders, of course, not in the health service uh, expenditure, not in the education expenditure, but in the military expenditure, even under the previous government. And under current government, it was even speeded up further. And of course, with war in Ukraine, Polish government is one of the most hawkish part of this you know, Western camp, with, again, really astonishingly uh, open propaganda about defending Western civilization and, you know, that it is war like de facto Polish leader Jarosław Kaczyński, who is neither prime minister nor president, but he is fact, in fact boss of both prime minister and president. He is the leader of, the, uh, of law and justice. Last year, uh, he said that uh, we cannot lose in Ukraine because the losing in Ukraine will be worse than losing in Vietnam. So it is like, like they see this very, very openly, like, you know, our war of Western camp for civilization, Western civilization, and, and that kind of stuff. And together, of course, with uh, Poland being leader of sending arms to Ukraine, it is uh, leader in its own militarization. Last year, mm -hmm was a you know, vote in a uh, Polish parliament, Polish you know, lower chamber of parliament, when they voted for 3% GDP for military expenditure to, to, to get to the 3% as soon as, as possible. And Polish president Andrzej Luda currently even said that three is not enough. It, it should be 4% GDP for military expenditure. So what would make Poland the you know, biggest spender in, in, in NATO um, in comparison, of course, to, to the size of, uh, of economy? And we have this militaristic, not only propaganda, but uh, approach, and we bought this, we bought that, really every day in the state on, on TV. Interestingly, with, of course, no opposition from the liberal side that feel quite, yeah, we have to support because it's reason that is our, you know, our state and we have to do it and so on. Right, so this is basically the situation, the current political situation in, uh, in Poland under law and, uh, and justice government. Mm. But importantly, there are also some challenges to this government and some contradictions, of course, of its own positions. The position of building so-called national capitalism that is, you know, great Poland, independent, and, and so on. Uh, on the other hand, uh, very much rooted in the, the idea that the transition went wrong because the old communists were still in charge. So we have to just break with this old post-communist build-up when the good patriotic Christian Polish businessmen will be leading Polish economy with Polish state, then you know honey and milk will go through the through the roads. So this is the basic uh, 
idea uh, selling to the, to the population. But now, of course, there are lots of challenges on the economic side with wages relatively stagnant in comparison to prices. Of course, the problem of inflation now in Poland is officially about 15% inflation, 1.5. But for food, for the you know, basic uh, needs, food, energy, it is even higher than that. And uh, there is a clear pressure for government who with its own you know, propaganda of success that really many people feel worse off than one year or two, two years ago. And we have the, last year we have the lowering of the, uh, of the real wages in Poland for the first time in, in many years, really. And there are also challenges on the other fronts. Probably you heard about really huge women's movement in Poland, especially in 2020, when the constitutional court, so-called court, uh, totally dependent on ruling party, ordered that you know current uh, abortion law in Poland that was already very very strict. It you know enabled abortion only in very limited conditions. But even this, they they declared it was illegal uh, according to Polish constitution and made the law even more strict. So what meant that uh, women, you know, people who who are pregnant and uh, even if the fetus is uh, sick and whatever, it, you have to still deliver. So there were really, really huge demonstrations, totally not expected by the government, especially it was the middle of pandemic, you know, autumn 2020. So the pandemic was in its, in its peak, but you have hundreds of thousands of people in the, in the streets in Poland against uh, against this uh, you know governmental policy and the whole uh, policy that the government is representing so s since then um, even if the, the movement didn't manage to, to break this law but what is really important the mood as for women's rights as for concrete you know, specifically abortion rights really changed in, in Poland especially among young people and even more especially among young women not surprisingly so now the, when you compare situation, for example, throughout the decade, uh, or even since peace started to rule in 2015, now you have much more you know, positive approach to abortion in itself and to abortion rights uh, in, uh, in, uh, in specificity. Okay, other problem for, for the government. Uh, is uh, also the issue of LGBT rights and the problems of uh, sexual scandals in Catholic Church. As you maybe know, you know, historically Catholic Church was very important pillar of the, what we can call Polish ideology. So this political Catholicism in the last 30 years, even if you know, the governments sometimes were not really very Catholic, for example, so-called post-communist governments, they also gave lots of money to church. Uh, being themselves atheist or, you know, very lightly religious people at most. But church was seen as important pillar of stability in Poland. Especially, for example, when Poland was to join EU, there was like an unofficial deal between government and, and the church that the government will not liberate abortion rights and the church will, you know, will not do anything against European Union and uh, that kind of build up we uh, confronted in Poland. But now with this you know, gradual but visible erosion of the position of Catholic Church and sexual scandals uh, included, uh, it's also of course a problem for the ruling party who is still very strongly devoted to political Catholicism as you know, important part of Polish nationalism and you know, being real Pole and, and so on. Okay. And uh, as for social movements, uh, one more important thing, you, we have also some strikes in Poland so on this you know, economic front, trade union front. The most important strike was teacher strike in 2019. Uh, unfortunately, it lost with all of its uh, um, results of this uh, losing that was you know, visible in 
all trade union movements, so we don't have many strikes in Poland now. Nevertheless, we have some, and there were some strikes in private sector, quite important, and now also in the you know, public, public sector that will be at least some protests against the you know, inflation and some, some protests for more money. And uh, you should know that peace government is very much anti-striking workers. So they, they want to show themselves as a good father in paternalistic way, giving money here and there when they choose, not too much, but when they choose. But the, when there are strikes, you have full-scale state propaganda against strikers. It was during teacher strikes, but also other important strikes, like some nurses' strikes, uh, strikes of workers of uh, of lot, so is the main flying, uh, you know, the, the operator of, uh, of planes. There were some strikes, and all, all the time when you have big strike, you have lots of anti-strike propaganda. So, so it's also important in this, uh, not only economic front, but in a way ideological front. It really undermines peace as a, you know, friend of the good Polish uh, ordinary people how they want to see themselves. OK, so just a few words about, don't want to talk too much, so just a few final words about before the chair will beat me, you know, and, and so on, about the opposition, including, you know, left-wing socialist uh, opposition. So as you can imagine, the main opposition are the former mainstream parties that ruled with some small uh, gaps until 2015, so the main opposition party called Civic Platform is like, still is the main bourgeois party in Poland. So big majority of well-off people, of people in some, you know, positions on the top in, in economic and, and so on, richer people simply, they vote clearly for Civic Platform, not for peace still. Uh, even if there are some pro-peace businessmen, but this is the, structure of this bourgeois class that is still devoted to traditional pro-EU, pro-liberal, uh, in this sense, uh, establishment. And they are, of course, under, under pressure from, from peace, under pressure from the general, much more widespread criticism of neoliberalism that used to be, and try to deal with it somehow, but uh, with many own contradictions. Mm, what is more dangerous, uh, we have also far-right opposition. It is a far-right coalition between fascists and some ultra-liberals. It is called Confederation, Confederacja. They attack priests from the, uh, from the right. Interestingly, peace has their own fascists, also kind of packet fascists, that they support financially. To also to make some kind of alternative to Confederacja. So they have their own fascists, they give lots of money to them. One of the splits, one can say, from Confederacja. So this far-right scene is unfortunately uh, quite rich in, in Poland. Confederacja has now something in opinion polls between 8 and 10 percent. And there is, of course, a left, both kind of official left, what is more like different version of liberalism, definitely more consistent as for the minority rights, especially you know, women's rights, gay rights, and so on. On the, on the same time, very much uh, liberal as for economic approach. And uh, the electorate of the official left is sometimes even more liberal in the economic sense than the civic platform uh, electorate. Uh, but there were always, always attempts to build some kind of alternative left in Poland for years, since the beginning of transition, in fact, with some you know, limited successes, but in itself uh, very positive uh, attitude and positive you know, developments. Mm. In last year, unfortunately, the most important party was called Together, Razem Party. They joined the official left coalition and clearly moved to the right in the last year, especially regarding war. So for example, deputies from Razem Party voted for 3% military expenditure of Poland, and they are sharing all this you know, vision of Western civilization embodied in EU and uh, what, whatever goes with this. 
uh, with this idealizing of Scandinavian social democracy as well. So this moving to the right is clearly, from our perspective, perspective very bad, bad move. Mm, nevertheless, we can still work together in various united fronts. And what I want to say, in, really, in the end, it's what we do as what we do as work as democracy, Pracownicza Demokracja, so you know, sister organization of Socialistyczka Solidarita in Poland. We try, besides of our own activity, like that kind of you know events, very important. Uh, events uh, like, like, like you do here. Mm. We built through various united fronts, especially against racism, with people from Razem, with people from Green Party also. Some really, you know, good people, even if Green Party in itself is in coalition with Civic Platform now, what is, you know, deeply problematic to, to put it uh, lightly. Nevertheless, uh, protests against racism against what is going on, for example, on the Belarusian border. Probably you heard people are dying in Polish Belarusian border. What is, of course, all these atrocities of Polish government with their open racism, but also atrocities of EU that is not really criticizing Polish government uh, for what's going on in the Belarusian border. And uh, what is quite shocking, for example, for some liberal NGOs and for some pro-EU, you know, EU-oriented people that how, why European Union doesn't criticize them. And uh, when they have some, you know, conflicts between Polish government and EU on various other fields, but not really this one, uh, when you have literally people dying in the, in the border. So the anti-racist activity is one of the most important parts. Other is, of course, this trade union activity and building in the unions trying to organized protest and being the unionist protest, of course, uh, we always try to do it. And probably the most difficult but very important anti-militaristic, anti anti-war protest now, not to let this um, growing uneasiness with what's going on about, you know, Polish militarization, but especially in, in, in this sense, you know, war, war in Ukraine and Polish position in this. Of course, also far right tries to build out of this, trying that to say that they are really the peace people. In fact, they simply hate Ukrainians, but they cover it with some peace rhetorics. So we have to propose our own real anti-militarism, anti-imperialism, like you know, this slogan, this beautiful slogan and very very important for the contemporary times. So we try to build this anti-militarization, anti-imperialist movement, of course, starting with our own state as so-called leader of the Central and Eastern Europe, how they would, would like to see it, and what we describe as a beggar imperialism of Polish state on the backs of Polish workers. Uh, so we are fighting, and hopefully, we have a word. Uh, I didn't say anything about ecologist uh, issues that are also important, so I don't have time to do it. But I mentioned we don't forget about this. And we have a word to win, and we have to do it. OK, uh, thank you very much, uh, Philip. Uh, so now it's time uh, for Aaron to speak. Hi. I, I guess I need to stand up as well. No. Perfect. <laughs> Um, nice to be here. Thanks, thanks for coming to this talk. Um, as I've been introduced, I'm from Sikra, Hungary, which means Spark. It's a young social green left movement that emerged from the basically anti-gentrification and housing protests in, in Budapest and um, started garnering membership. I'll say a few words about that in just a bit, but I will also um, continue this theme of going in depth. Now we'll try to give a, a short overview of what's up in Hungary, keeping time in mind as well. Um, there's a, a certain aura of mystery regarding the, the Orban regime. Often there's this story of him having been a liberal, a convinced liberal, and then suddenly lurching to the right and this aura of mystery, this fascination that he seems to exert on, I guess, the far right, but on a more global scale as well, 
is kind of confusing this shape shifting persona. Um, in fact, if we look at it, it's a very boring person uh, who has a very specific flair for opportunism and riding waves of changes on a global level. Orban, um, since 2010, we've had him in power since 2010, marks a rupture, but also certain continuities, continuities that we can trace back. Um, if we want to go way back, um, we could go back to the 1960s already, when after the 1956 uh, revolution that was put down by Soviet tanks, um, a certain social compromise was established between the ruling regime and the working class and the rising urban class as well as uh, hundreds of thousands of people from uh, the regions joined agglomerations. And so lots of people in Hungary saw a rise in living standards, um, which is undeniable despite all the crimes of the old regime. This um, arrangement was made possible by a very specific economic model which relied on what has been called Hungary's bridge position between East and West. The idea was basically to import Western technology into the Eastern Bloc and through this trade upgrade its technology, um, upgrade its position within the global value chain and um, lead to rising living standards. This model um, started dissolving in the wake of the global debt crisis in the 70s, and by the 80s, the social mobility we had in Hungary earlier was already grinding to a halt. Um, I'm bringing this up because this longer history shows that Hungary has been integrated into a world economy for a very long time, not only after 89. And amongst all the, bloc, all the countries of the Eastern Bloc, maybe with the exception of Yugoslavia, it was the one that has been the most integrated into a capitalist economy and was thus, in a way, the most open. This facilitated its entry into a, a global capitalist system in the 90s, um, and Hungary was presented as this miracle uh, with huge investment opportunities for Western um, backed capital to come into the region, whereas in other countries, like even here um, or in Slovenia, there was some state protection for old state firms. In Hungary, basically everything was sold off um, in pursuit of chief capital, of uh, easy and quick capital. Um, another difference with Poland, for example, is that Hungary paid back its debt, which was huge, its sovereign debt in full, and made a matter of uh, morality out of it, whereas other countries renegotiated it. So Hungary basically stumbled into the 90s and 2000s as liberalism's poster child. But by the time the great crisis in 2008 hit, um, Hungary, because of its exposure, was also the country that arguably suffered the biggest and longest setback in the region. If we look at other countries um, surrounding us, um, here the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, all the other countries rebounded much faster. But in Hungary, it was a deep social crisis and a sense of total state disintegration in the late 2000s, um, exemplified by um, projects to totally privatize the healthcare under the nominally social democratic government, uh, street violence, murders of Roma innocent people in villages by the rising far right. And so this wave of discontent was um, very deftly um, used by Orban, who was in opposition at the time, to craft a form of alliance between local capital, local business owners who felt left out by the previous arrangement, who felt that this totally globalized economy didn't trickle down to them, but also between the new Hungarian governments and international industry. As we've seen throughout Eastern Europe, there's a period of reindustrialization that started in the 2010s, mainly around um, auto industry. 
Um, we see it here, we see it in Slovakia, we see it in Hungary, and this allowed the government to create extremely favorable positions to mainly the German automobile industry. Um, I don't want to get too academic, uh, we can discuss it later, but it's important, I believe, to try to understand what we're up against. Obviously, the Orban regime has um, fascist elements, but describing it simply as fascism is not helpful either analytically or politically either. Um, it's important also to understand who, have, who has profited from this regime. In the 2010s, we've seen big inflow of EU money, which has allowed the government to centralize spending and to elevate hundreds of thousands of people who had been jobless in the 2000s or after the crisis into a situation of dependence and what has been called a financial vertical leading up to the state. But perhaps what's the most striking and the most important is that rather than being some kind of 21st century fascism, what we see in the Orban regime is, in a way, the logical conclusion, the logical frontier of a neoliberal logic brought to its logical conclusion. Um, we see, basically, Hungary has been operating as a tax haven, um, whereas there's a 20%, 27% VAT, the highest in Europe, um, with all the um, the costs being borne by the citizens and most often the, the poorest citizens. So we see rising inequalities alongside the rise of uh, an empowered nativist um, entrepreneurial class. Um, and we see these zones basically of extraction um, not only for international um, capital but also for local entrepreneurs uh, for whom the government has carved a niche in low added value sectors such as construction, tourism, but also the banking sector. This social contract is always fragile, always almost imploding. And if we want to understand the culture wars that have dominated Hungary in the past 10, 12 years, um, this offers a good perspective. We see that every time there's a point of crisis, a point of seemingly no return, a new enemy figure is introduced, whether the Roma, um, the refugees in 2015, Shorosh, um, the Ukrainians, um, the EU, and this comes like clockwork um, every time. This has also been enabled by the absolutely toothless opposition, which has been playing the same playbook basically in the past 12 years literally the same figures whose catastrophic management uh, led to the two-thirds majority of the government in 2010 have been continuously in place. And they have been not only um, incapable, but also uninterested to amplify the waves of social discontent, which happened, for example, in 2018, when what, what has been called the slave laws uh, were introduced when 400 hours of um, extra unpaid um, overwork were enshrined into law. Um, the, situ the situation today is, is very dire yet again. After the triumph at the last election, we are the first in terms of inflation um, across the last year in the EU. Um, there have been protests, um, particularly the teachers who have been the highest hit. Um, in the past year, but these protests remain quite apolitical in nature. And um, there's a certain refusal on the part of the political opposition elites to meet these demands where they are. Uh, that is uh, a needs-based politics. Um, the initial invitation was to talk about the far right and power. Obviously, um, the government in Hungary cannot be described otherwise as a far-right government, um, but it has also very creatively managed the presence of an even more outspoken far-right. We had this with the Jobbik party in the early 2010s, uh, which allowed the government to situate itself as some kind of mediator between the liberal opposition and the openly fascist far-right. Um, 
In the latest elections, uh, a new far-right party emerged, our homeland, which has um, thematized, in a way, very effectively, real problems such as um, expropriations, such as the need to um, have a self-determination over agriculture, or um, issues that the left or the liberal opposition has totally abandoned. And this has doubtless contributed to their popularity alongside um, you know, COVID agnosticism or an openly far-right uh, discourse regarding race and um, things you have seen in each of your countries. Um, so this is a situation that is obviously very hard to live with on an everyday basis because we see that even the, the meager protections liberal democracy allows one in other countries are not there in Hungary, where we have courts totally subordinated to the government, um, waning freedom of press and independent media, and a slow stifling of everything related to culture, alongside hate discourse against refugees, women, gays, trans people. This is the context in which we have been born, I would say, and my generation of um, political activists have um, come to age under this government, which has been in place in the past 13 years. Um, so Sikra started in Budapest, um, which we cannot deny, even though um, that's also a cause of problem, problems um, and future problems. It came out, as I said earlier, out of um, housing protests and out of a milieu of left-wing activists who were tired of the status quo and who wanted to find some kind of political outlet to the ever-growing frustration and shrinking of public space. We initially decided to support candidates in municipal elections in 2019 who proposed a more humane solutions to questions of homelessness, of public space, of privatization. Um, we have also been debating at every stage the way we engage with institutional politics, knowing well the limits and possible risk of co-optation. Um, but given the situation, we decided to engage in the opposition primaries with one candidate, Andra Shambor, the founder of a left-wing news outlet, Mirce, very similar to the Czech Alarm, um, who ran in the opposition primaries in the heart of Budapest, in one of its most unequal and poor, um, but also rapidly gentrifying neighborhoods. He won the primaries and then won the general elections last year. So we've entered parliament. Um, and we continue to play on, I would say, three different um, tableaus. On the one hand, trying to use the funds and visibility um, that institutional politics allow and the other building relations with social movements, with trade unions um, that have been completely obliterated and forgotten in most of Hungary, trying to rebuild these relations with people fighting for their lives uh, and for their livelihoods. For instance, uh, we were in Hungary, in southern Hungary, in a continental factory a few times where workers have been on strike uh, repeatedly over the past years, but also trying to internally build an organization that is capable to weather this ongoing storm and to present a model um, that gives us the resilience and power to be able to build solidarity. Um, so our, our internal structure is based on mutual aid, on education. We have a very strong education program. Um, and on uh, concrete um, actions in uh, the streets, but also for locals in, um, in conjunction with local initiatives, housing groups, civic initiatives. Um, we're going to run in the municipal elections next year, but we also fully realize that uh, gaining positions is not enough if we cannot build a real alternative. Um, I think that's it for me now. I would love to have some questions and to be able to chat. Okay.
Okay, thank you very much uh, to Aaron. Uh, now uh, there is a room for uh, questions. So uh, who would like to ask something? You can ask uh, in English or also in Czech, and I will try to translate to English. Můžete se zeptat i česky, pokud se necítíte na angličtinu, pokusím se to přeložit. Thank you for both uh, uh, both your um, lectures. Uh, I have a question for both of you, uh, but uh, for each of you. Uh, I don't know, independently. <laughs> so uh, my first question is for uh, Philip. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the, I don't know, summary of the Polish situation. Uh, I know a little bit about Polish culture because I uh, come from a village near the Polish border. So I watched Wieczorinka when I was little and uh, yeah, we always watched uh, Polish TV. Uh, but, uh, I was very surprised, nonetheless, uh, that our situation is very uh, similar. Uh, I thought uh, that the Polish uh, problem or situation comes uh, much more from the cultural debate and not from the uh, like social or economic populism, uh, because I thought that was just here and uh, in Poland that it is, it is more like uh, this ideological or cultural uh, cultural identity. So uh, that was very interesting for me. And uh, my question is, uh, you said that uh, the Catholic Church is uh, losing its appeal in Poland. Uh, I wasn't aware of this uh, because uh, in the agricultural area uh, near my village, it still looks the same, uh, <laughs> I would say. So that's my question. And after that, I will uh, ask the uh, next lecture. OK, thanks for your good words. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think when you live close to the border, so probably the situation small villages on the both sides of the border is kind of similar. Uh, but okay, don't, don't want to go <laughs> further in this, but uh, as for the issue of Catholic change, uh, Church, you know, the losing of position of Catholic Church, is, it's not like rapid, uh, you know, collapse. Nevertheless, it is really visible that this, you know, drop by drop, uh, quantitative change really is turning into some kind of new quality when you use this you know, language of dialectics. So especially with young generation, they don't really listen to church appeal. What makes church rulers quite angry and you know, they don't, it's a new situation for them that they are saying something that you know, young people do not care too much. So. It is quite important change also in politics because uh, what would be impossible, for example, two decades ago that you have uh, some materials about, uh, you know, scandals, sexual scandals. I don't know if it is the proper name. It's just, you know, raping kids and it's not sexual scandal, but some that kind of issue in church that are going out really and even Two months ago, one of the key stations, it was a material that when Polish Pope, holy person in Poland, you know, our pride in all the world and whatever, that Polish Pope, before he was a Pope, when he was a Bishop, he also did this practice of, you know, replacing, so picking people who were uh, accused of some at least misconduct against, uh, against kids and just put them into other positions. And there was a material in this. And of course, it was a big scandal in the state media. Nevertheless, even the material itself and talking about this would be simply impossible some decades ago about, you know, Polish Pope. How can, oh my God, it's like, you know, God doesn't exist nearly, and so on so important for the ideological point of view as for the pillars in the Polish ideology in the last years. It's on, of course, it's only one of the pillars and Polish Catholic Church is part of the ruling class, the church hierarchy, not the whole of the ruling class. 
but uh, it is important development and positive from point of view of the of the of, of the left of you know people who are on the side of the oppressed and and exploited what the left should be and what is the definition of the left in the end i think so that's it thank you very much uh and uh, my second question uh, is regarding the corporate tax in Hungary, which is, I think, 9% or something like that. And also, uh, Hungary, I think, uh, uh, vetoed the vote on the European corporate tax uh, to have it uh, around 20%, I think. Uh, so I uh, just wanted to ask uh, if uh, this um, corporate tax uh, policy is coming from the era of the liberal poster child, you were saying, uh, or if it's a part of the policy uh, how to uh, come uh, out of the crisis in whichever way uh, they feel like after the 2008. Thanks for these very well informed questions. <laughs> Um, the figures are totally right, and I hope everyone is shocked. Um, except if you want to come do business in Hungary, um, you'll have a great time. Um, so come and invest. Um, the, the corporate tax was very low to start with, but it was further reduced in 2011 um, when the government transitioned to a flat tax system. Um, yeah, I think that's basically the answer. Um, in the first um, Fidesz um, government in 2010-2014, it introduced uh, a variety of measures like this to, um, to offset, um, in a way, the so-called unorthodox policies it was pursuing. Because basically, um, I mean, we can discuss it later. I don't know how um, academic we want to go here, but basically um, it uh, walked away from the IMF and had to kind of recoup those funds that were promised by um, international um, funders, um, but rather than using this to build a socially minded system, in a way it um, annexed even more state revenue um, in its own hands. That's when um, basically it um, nationalized uh, a pension system um, that had been largely privatized, which is not necessarily a bad move, but rather than um, working on a more um, equally um, minded system, it created one that was even more hierarchical. Um, and what we see 10 years later is a, is a government that's totally at loss with ideas in the last elections. It didn't even have an election program. Um, so there's nothing to campaign on. Um, whereas in the early 2010s, it had some kind of ideology and tried to engineer a new social reality. What we see in the past five, six years is, uh, is a regime quite desperate. And that's why um, it is also so open to the new waves of industrialization um, that come with um, the, the green transition, basically. Uh, what we see in the past two years is uh, the establishment of a huge number of factories, mainly for um, car battery production, uh, which have a huge ecological cost and work extremely exploitatively. So it seems that Hungary, um, again, is becoming uh, an example of what uh, a capitalist so-called green transition will look like, which um, places profit in front of the people and in the name of greening the planet, um, abolishes even the last vestiges of labor law. Thank you very much. Uh, next question, uh, Peter Rohel. I have questions on both references. A pr první otázka je tedy, jak se snaží prosazovat nějaké internacionalistické protiválečné stanovisko v době v současnosti. 
A zda, zda v, při, vzle, k tomu se snaží nějak navázat, navázat kontakty s, s, rusk, s ruským míro, s mírovými hnutími, i když vím, že je to nesmírně obtížné. Je, je to složitější, ale ve, v největší zkratce takhle. Takže si kdyby mi odpověděli, a pak druhá. Uh, OK, so this question is for uh, both of you and uh, the question is uh, how do you uh, like uh, how do you push for uh, anti-war uh, anti-war proclamations or anti-war uh, stance in uh, your countries or your um, movements and uh, the second question is uh, if you are in contact with the uh, Russian anti-war movement you can answer I guess uh, one by one okay as for um, the you know position and that we have in Poland, uh, as I said a little bit before, um, of course we want to concentrate of Polish militarization and Polish involvement on all, all this uh, arms race in the area. That is not really new. It started even before Poland was one of the important part of this arms race in the area with Polish official uh, when you look, uh, read official documents of Polish president, Polish government, nothing really, really hidden that Polish uh, mm, ambitions were to extend this, you know, Western values, Western uh, sphere into the countries like Belarus, Moldova, Ukraine, of course, uh, Georgia, so these post-Soviet republics that you know, are part of this conflict between Russian imperialism and Western imperialism. And Poland see itself, so Polish rulers see itself as, a, in, as an important player in this race, of course, on the side of the West and as a kind of the, you know, the f most for forward uh, uh, part of the Western civilization that has its own interests, but also duties for the all civilized, so-called civilized West here. So we are, of course, opposing this, and we very straightforwardly are against Polish militarization. And as for the, you know, Ukrainian war, it is very important to stress that we have lots of Ukrainian refugees in Poland, mm. especially in the beginning of the war. There were like. Uh, 300,000, two to 300,000 refugees only in Warsaw. So it was like 10% of population of Warsaw were really lots of people. You can hear Russian and Ukrainian on the, on the streets. So really big, big number. And uh, it is important, of course, that we say we are in solidarity with refugees. We welcome refugees. People are escaping war and should be welcomed. And this one, one of the also important part of our, our message. And then we, of course, we say we are against Russian invasion, but also against Western involvement, NATO, you know, part of this uh, race uh, in this part of the, of the world. And what uh, comes out of our analysis of imperialism as such, that imperialism is not one power. It's not that only Russian is imperialist, like Polish government says, and it's not only that only, I don't know, United States is imperialist. You have inter-imperialist conflict. And now the war in Ukraine is clearly very much, you cannot understand war in Ukraine without seeing this against this um, picture of inter-imperialist conflict. So we are clearly you know, against Polish involvement in this uh, as an ambition player, including its own militarization, including selling arms or selling, giving arms to Ukraine that, as I said, Poland is also one of the most um, forward-oriented part of uh, Western coalition here, together with Great Britain, even more than United States. It is basically like the old coalition of the willing during Iraqi war, right? So UK states and the Eastern European states with the, maybe <laughs> this is a big uh, difference, the Hungarian 
Hungarian case. I, I would like to say a little bit more later about this Polish-Hungarian relation because Polish government and Hungarian relation, I will maybe talk a bit uh, later, but it is in itself interesting point. But war is a very important issue and militarization is a very important issue. Of course, we have to build real anti-war, anti-militaristic movement because government says, that they say they, we are anti-war, so we want to fight Putin. So of course, it is not anti-war position. It is, let's start bigger war position, what they really, what they really propose. And uh, clearly, we oppose this. Thank you. So, Aaron, please, uh, you, can, you can answer. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I suspect there might be um, a divergence in opinion regarding the war, but I would also like to avoid getting into a big geopolitical discussion here. Um, what I can say is that, obviously, with SICRA, we're committed to an anti-militarist agenda. Uh, we're not enthusiastic about NATO. We don't believe the EU is the crown jewel of Western glory. Um, before the war, Hungary was the biggest buyer of German defense industry worldwide. Um, so this was a, a worrying development which predates the war in Ukraine. And obviously the rhetoric, the racist, uh, sickening rhetoric that uh, was normalized um, after the launch of the war is something we denounce informed by our own East European condition, I think we can recognize there are different imperialisms and different levels of coloniality, um, and that the war in Ukraine has also acquired uh, an inter-imperial dimension. But we also believe that um, just calling for peace as such is not a new, as a neutral statement as it sounds. and. Um, Happy to discuss this later, maybe alongside Ilya Edinburgh, perhaps. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your answers. Uh, I think Petr had another question. Měl se další otázku, Petře? Nebylo mi odpovězeno ty kontakty s tím ruským protiválečným hnutím. Jednou větou stačí, jsou, nejsou, jaké jsou. Yeah, so the second question was uh, just about the, the contact uh, with the uh, Russian anti-war uh, movement, uh, if you have uh, uh, any contact uh, or not. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I forgot. Yeah, in fact, we don't. We really apologize, but because Poland has a border with Russia, you know, with Kaliningrad uh, Oblast, uh, Kaliningrad area, so it would be, of course, very good to have some such contacts, but in fact, we don't have any. Besides of, you know, why this, when we do our actions, we all, always shout something in solidarity with Russian anti-war movement and liberate prisoners, whatever. But they're not really like direct contacts. Uh, yeah, so in uh, Hungary, it's uh, the same. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the next question was in the front. Uh, just wait for the microphone, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I wanted to follow up a little bit on the Ukraine question, hopefully in a, in a productive and peaceful way. Um, that, uh, I mean, I, the, the slogan, neither Washington nor Moscow is a great slogan, um, but I, I do have questions about how, how it can be formulated in concrete ways that makes sense to people who are, A, people who are, don't quite know what you mean by it, and especially since you said it's important to distinguish the difference between when we say that and when the far right says it. I, mean, I don't know how much you follow Czech politics, but there's also a protest movement here called basically Czechia first, Česko na první místě, which is very much taken up the, the banner of fighting against inflation and fighting against the bad living conditions and blaming it on, on Ukraine and Ukrainians and re refugees, but, but also on the military aid to Ukraine. Um, I mean, it's a complicated movement that can be also subject for a long conversation, but, but definitely there's a strong far right element in it. Um, so yeah, so the concretely how to formulate another 
maybe a independent position or a regional position. But this, so this brings me to the second half of the question, which was uh, talking about the flat tax. Just reminded me of this historical development, which was that up until around the time of these countries, Central European countries accession into the EU, the right tended to be very much pro-Western, either pro-Western Europe or, or North Atlanticist um, US and the UK. And so, at, no matter what the reality was in the West, every slogan was like, we need to liberalize, we need to privatize, we need to dismantle our wel welfare state, because that's what they do in the West. And then around, uh, I, I remember it was like the early 2000s, mid 2000s, there started to be much more of this rhetoric of like, now we need, we need the flat tax. Oh, I guess they don't do this in the West. Well, we're better than the West. We're creating our own, uh, our own independent, you know, the, the models aren't the UK and the US, the models are like uh, Latvia. Um, and, and we need to do that here. And, and then when Kaczynski, the, the two Kaczynskis and Orban became more powerful, then it got more and more connected to this nationalist, uh, dimension, but still with elements of the old neoliberal dogma. And they, I mean, they succeeded where the West didn't succeed in creating a kind of idea of some different Eastern or Central Eastern European uh, idea of a, a different political model. Um, and not in, but not in the case of Ukraine. In the case of Ukraine, they've diverged. Or there hasn't, but, but I mean, is there a possibility of coming up with a, a left, a left version of some kind of independent approach that doesn't, I mean, one thing is to say if we're in, it's part of what the left should do is always criti criticize your own government. If your government is militarizing, criticize its militarization. But the other thing, the other thing about internationalism is to put yourself in the shoes of someone else. And so also say like, if I were in Ukraine, what would I want, kind of. And so maybe that's the part that I, that I still think maybe the left needs to figure out a little a more robust answer to that question when people ask what we want to do about Ukraine so that we don't just say either support what NATO is doing without any further uh, elaboration or just say peace and end it there because because of the problems that were already raised. So uh, who wants to answer this question first? Okay. Yeah, of course, quite a, you know, long contribution and uh, in itself uh, yeah many many aspects that you said about w i start with this independence uh, independent approach of the left that you that that you that you mentioned that uh, as a left we should be critical to the government but then maybe i don't know I, I don't know if I get uh, get you rightly but to look at well, the focus on your own government but but also look at the situation somewhere else and mm -hmm. see what, put yourself in the shoes of people in other countries. Yeah, in other countries, okay. Yeah, I think we know what left should do always uh, and what does it mean to be on the left? What I try to, to stress a bit, left means being on the side of the oppressed and exploited, right? And the farther we are consistent in it, I think the, the, the farther we can call ourselves that it is the proper position. So when there are, I know, of course, this economic exploitation, but also various parts of various kinds of oppression. And we are not neutral in this. We are on the side of the oppressed. We are on the side of the exploited. And we have our analysis in uh, all this. That, that's abs absolutely clear. Yeah. When you address this into analysis, uh, I think so, yeah, of, uh, of imperialism and wars and uh, militarization, First of all, of course, we see it as an integral part of the capitalist system. It's not accidental part of the, of the system. No, it is integral part of the system. And uh, here, when you are really, really you know, specific about, uh, about Ukraine, clearly Ukraine was, since years, um, a place when the, both Russian imperialism and Western imperialism, including countries like Poland who try to play its role, that it was a battle over it and trying to get to the one or other side with really horrible uh, 
events uh, that you know the, the the current war is the most horrible of uh, of all of those events but the roots are deeply visible there right since independence and especially since 2000 you have so called orange revolution all the other developments in ukraine when the very i think you know legitimate demands of of people you know criticizing their governments, oligarchy, and whatever. But they were channeled into both domestic politics and geopolitics, in the end, into whether you support Western orientation, Russian orientation. And it was absolutely tragedy for the Ukrainian movements then themselves, right? And as I said, the, the, the war is now the, the last accord of, uh, the most tragic accord of this. I think clearly, Mm, in countries like Poland especially, we have to stress on the Western role of all of these processes that led to war and the current Western politics, so using the Ukrainian war for their own you know, objectives and for their um, own uh, interests, but without in any sense mm, you know, saying that Russia is in any sense better or alternative or whatever. Of course, of course not. Yeah, just like great Polish German revolutionary Rosa Luxemburg, who was both criticizing Tsarist Russia and Kaiserist Germany, I think it is very much possible approach still that you don't have to be in this trap of choosing the so-called lesser evil when clearly systemically uh, the the whole war is very much rooted in this rivalry of those evils, if you want to call it uh, like this. And as for what you said about Czech Republic, this movement, right-wing, so-called peace movement. Yeah, in fact, I agree that it's not enough to talk about peace. And I agree, yes. you have to we have to say that our governments are bastards. We have to say that you know, the rules of the world, of course, the, the biggest, especially like uh, Putin, Biden, whatever, they are the biggest really, killers of the world. It's not just to say, please, dear leaders, go and have a peace. And of course not. Yeah, We have to be actively building, building, building a movement against all those people, including their local versions, like in, for example, Poland, where we have really nasty militaristic government, very, very much oriented to this Western militarization and, you know, let Ukrainian win and we destroy Russia. And they're quite open all this on, on their politics in this. So not talk only about, uh, about peace for sure and for sure distancing itself, uh, ourselves from all this kind of right-wing uh, seed of peace movement and uh, in fact racist movement. We have also in Poland, in a smaller scale, the movement that say, about peace, but then they say that we don't know, we don't want Ukrainization of Poland. What is in fact simply attacking refugees from Ukraine. So absolutely it's important for us not only to, to say we have nothing to do with those guys, but to build alternative. Because in the end, I think, when the left and the really anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist left uh, will not take this initiative of building anti-militaristic movement, we simply leave the ground for such a bastards. And they can use then the peace slogans and the, the feeling for their own dirty reasons. So it is our duty to, to build a real, really, you know, anti-imperialist movement with this, you know, objective. Uh, and, well, both in you know, Poland and, and Czech Republic, in Hungary, definitely with the different condition a little bit. But if not we, nobody will do it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Aaron, do you want uh, to answer uh, also? Sure, yeah. We, we are also on the side of oppressed. Um, that's important to state. Um, I mean, it seems we've been dragged into the Ukrainian question. Um, so maybe just a few comments. I, um, we obviously understand the reservations and the very real worries and the very real possibility of a nuclear war. This is not to be underestimated. 
But I would also say it is quite worrying when we have such a conflict and it seems that we do not pay attention to the actual socialists, the actual leftists on the ground and to what they're saying. So we've been listening to people in Russia like, I don't know, Ilya Budraitsky, the anti-war feminist movement. We've been listening to people in Ukraine, in the Ukrainian trade union movement. We have connections or people around the Commons Journal, Spilne. Um, and as in every conflict, we believe it's also important as much as possible to defer to the people who are there and who understand these systems better than we do from the outside. Um, so obviously we can debate Ukraine, we can formulate a correct position on Ukraine, but I would also add that, for example, in Hungary, Ukraine is not amongst the top 10, 20, or maybe even 50 priorities of the people living there. Um, just as refugees or trans kids or um, any cultural issue uh, is not amongst the top 50, despite what the government wants us to believe. Um, I would also like to say that, for example, in Sikra, we've had a very strong stance regarding Rojava. We've organized demonstrations for the Kurdish um, revolution, but we have not put out a statement regarding Yemen. We haven't formulated a correct position regarding um, what's happening in Tigray. We did not propose the diplomatic miracle for um, Taiwan. And I don't think um, that's necessarily up to us to do. Um, what I want to know is to find the correct way to convince the poorest people in Hungary, those who have lost the most under this government, not to vote for this government. That's the question we need to be uh, correct about. Um, and just to get back to Joe's last, last point, um, this is something that guides us very much. Um, reclaiming Eastern Europe as a, as a space of hope and em emancipation. Um, on a personal level, um, my parents met in Prague for the first time after 89, um, in a moment when Eastern Europe was a space of hope. Um, of course, with hindsight, we can think that the last 30 years of unabashed capitalist development were inevitable, but at one point, around 89, there was still lots of hope, and the people in 89 did not vote for the flat tax and for the destruction of the trade unions and for the destruction of um, a property that was much more collective than it has become. And lots uh, unites us in Eastern Europe, uh, common histories, common impression, common struggles as well. Um, Poland and Hungary uh, have a strong um, history of freedom fights. We're very, um, still very grateful for the Polish revolutionaries who came to support our, our war of independence in 1848. It is very important, and this is uh, a left-wing progressive heritage to reclaim. And I hope um, these conversations, despite our differences and important disagreements and debates, uh, which I welcome, can contribute to that. Uh, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, time is almost up, so there is room for one last uh, question. It was from uh, Ola. Not sure, maybe I can give up my question to someone else because I still wanted to talk about the war in Ukraine. So maybe like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask this question because there's been a lot of words here, especially from Philip. And I understand like finding out about the corrective position, uh, correct posi position and what was it? Uh, find the proper analysis, blah, blah, blah. But the point is that right now, as we're having those conversations here, there are people being bombed. And what do we do in these situations? And I understand that Ukrainians are unable uh, probably to fight themselves without the help of the you know, other countries, without international solidarity, so to put it in other ways. And I really don't know what to do about it. Of course, I'm anti-militaristic, but we do, in Poland, there's still this kind of sentiment from World War II that we were hope. I mean, maybe it's also this nationalistic agenda that you've mentioned, right? 
but that we were counting for the help of the West and they never did it. Then, you know, like 1939, then 1944, yeah, the uh, wars arising, we were waiting for the help of the Soviet Union. They were waiting and they, you know, yet again we were uh, abandoned. So, I mean, yeah, like jokes aside, I mean, what to do, how to help Ukrainians right now so that they don't die right now? So who wants to answer first? Philip? Okay. I don't know if there are any other, but sure. It is absolutely a very concrete question. Not only, maybe I still would like to stand, what you said about these Polish nationalistic sentiments is absolutely true. There's a lot of mythology about uh, Poland. And uh, with this mythology, of course, nobody talks about this, that we have now exactly 20 years of Iraq invasion, and Poland was one of only four countries, besides of United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, that delivered troops to the initial invasion, 20th March 20, 2003. Yeah, it's a, it is like something written off history. Poland was always attacked. Poland is always innocent, is the Christ of the nations, and all this stuff, right? So just. Just this, but uh, this is this is important uh, you know, part of Ordia's argument in uh, you know, in Polish state and uh, the whole ideology that I mentioned of Polish nationalism is as all uh, nationalism are based in such a myths and uh, such of you know kind of distortion of historical memories and what you remember or what you don't remember. And, uh, well, um, first duty for the left is being uh, independent of its own rulers and of its own governments. If uh, we have just a position of tailing Polish government and saying what Jarosław Kaczyński and Peace and other are saying, and they are saying it very strongly, so it is really hard to say that we are in any sense in a leftist position towards the issue of militarization and war in the, both in Ukraine and in the whole area. This is the question, for example, I don't know, if you, are, if you have bombing of Yugoslavia in 2029, what then we should say? We should say they have to defend themselves, so maybe Russia and China should deliver anti-aircraft uh, something to Belgrade or to other parts and forgot about everything else and what then Russian socialists should say because we are in this position if we were Russian socialists in 1999 and Russia will give some arms saying that there are people being bombed we have to defend them and we just forget about everything else about the whole context about the inter-imperialist rivalry about crimes of the local regime as well. We just concentrate on this and uh, we are in fact uh, becoming kind of parrots of our own governments. So this position I think, but really seriously, will create out of us totally opportunistic uh, so-called left, not a real one in the current situation in Polish state. You mentioned, I think you, uh, you mentioned also, and you, you also, uh, and you, uh, the say, the, the position of you, some uh, Ukrainian leftist, uh, what is true, by the way, but, but in fact, when you look at the Polish leftist, large part of Polish left supports Polish militarization. So then, if you see in this uh, prism from abroad, you say, you see, you have most of Polish left support Poland spending 3% GDP on arms, so what can we do? I think it can be used as a kind of alibi, the opportunistic position of large part of Polish left then can be used as kind of alibi for simply wrong position supporting own militaristic, imperialistic government in our own countries. And uh, I don't think it's a proper way and to, if you lose that general picture, then you can very easily simply go into this, you know, tailist version of, uh, of politics that we should absolutely avoid. 
especially in the states, seriously, especially in states like Poland, that is very active part of this conflict nowadays. And we have to be separate from those militaristic milieu with their old vision of Western civilization and big civilization uh, fight, how they see it, civilization against Russian barbarism and we Poles as a proud part of this. Absolutely, we have to say no to this and we have to build anti-militaristic, anti-imperialist, really anti-imperialist movement saying that, of course, Putin is bastard, imperialist bastard and a killer, but Western bastards are no alternative to him. And this is also duty for the Ukrainian leftist, I think. It is also, it is not that position of Zelensky government helps Ukrainian ordinary people not being killed out of the bombs. Definitely doesn't help to stick to the NATO states is not helping at all. To see itself as a part of the big conflict between, you know, West and the East, like, uh, like <laughs> President Zelensky said, yeah, we revitalize the West and all this bullshit. It doesn't helping anyone, definitely not helping people being bombed in Ukraine with the, you know, possibilities of even bigger escalation when you have the position like Polish government who is very happy about heating up all this, uh, all this situation. So neither Washington nor Moscow nor Warsaw and the other countries like this. Okay, uh, thank you, Aaron. Can you, uh, do you want to answer? Yeah, maybe briefly and then maybe a last question. Um, I'm also against the flat tax um, as proposed by Zelensky and against the retrograde trade union laws. But if one thing history has taught us that we need to separate governments from the people. Um, but now I'm just gonna hijack a bit this question to speak about something a bit different, but I think uh, something quite related coming from Hungarian experience. In 2020, um, it was revealed that there were projects to establish a Chinese state university in Budapest, Fudan University. And um, it was COVID, but there was lots of um, criticism from the opposition. And lots of this criticism was explicitly racist and used Cold War rhetoric, um, which regardless of what we believe about the Chinese government, normalized uh, a form of um, racism and this idea of white exceptionalism that Hungary would belong to. Um, it was a difficult moment because it appeared like we again had to choose in a way between a rock and a hard place, particularly as this came a year after Central European University, uh, an independent uh, Soros um, founded university was expelled from Budapest. Um, but we also sensed a moment of opportunity because this wasn't about entering big civilizational discourses that were imposed upon us from above. Um, so what we did at the time is try to understand what the effect of building this university would really be in Hungary. And the real effect was for this university to be built on a housing project for students. So the issue wasn't that, oh, we need to choose in a huge class of civilization between the Western and the Eastern Bloc. The issue was we need to choose uh, a solution uh, that helps housing in Budapest and helps those who need it. So when we, um, we organized uh, with Sikra a demonstration in um, summer 2021 um, against uh, this university, but we did our best not to uh, have um, a discourse against uh, Chinese influence or against the decline of the West or whatever. We did our best to place housing, housing rights, rights to the city in the foreground of our demands. And this demonstration um, is basically what give, gave the impetus to our candidate to then win the primaries and then enter parliament. 
Um, and what we realized is that the people there, the students, um, those who have to live with rising costs and unpayable flats, were not interested in having to choose between a Chinese um, elite university and uh, racist rhetoric from the liberal opposition, but what they needed was a narrative and the possibility of um, accessible housing for all. Thank you very much. Uh, so maybe uh, one uh, last, uh, ah, no, okay. Uh, so yeah, I thought there will be room for one last uh, quick question, but uh, we need to prepare for the following, uh, following discussion, which will start at uh, 6 uh, p.m. It's, uh, it will be about the uh, French protests against uh, the pension Comrade, reforms. Uh, just one minute, please. Are you about Polish-Hungarian uh, government and relation? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. We will have to uh, talk about it. Uh, talk about it later. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah. So anyway, if you have any other questions or uh, if you want to debate uh, further, then uh, of course uh, there will be a whole uh, evening, and you can discuss. Okay. So uh, see you at 6 uh, p.m. And thank you very much for listening.